and um, but um, uh, I'm rolling. There, there will be that. Um, yeah. Let me just see if I can. So this is um, November sixteenth, twenty twenty three. We're at the Waging Liberation Conference, and we're so excited to have Jamie Edwards here, who's president of the Trader Joe's United. We would like you to explain how you did it. How did you organize your co-workers? We know right now, historically, we have folks under 30 that support labor unions, but we don't have the expansion of unionization that correlates with that sentiment. So your story is pivotal right now for people to learn from and to be inspired and to learn how to do what you did. How did you do it? So do you want the, the long version or the short version? version? All right, the long version. All right. So first I want to say too about like talking about young people and labor and everything. Um, I do feel like um, our union has been really good with that, like bringing up a lot of the younger people. Right now I think we have, um, we have like multiple officers in different locals that are like in their early 20s. So like that's definitely a thing that we've been trying to do to prepare that next generation to take up more um, organizing roles. And um, even in our local, a lot of our support are younger people. We even have like, um, one student who applied because he heard about our start organizing. This was a high school kid. Um, I wish I had that level of class consciousness when I was his age. But um, the story of how we organize, um, well, uh, I guess I could start the pandemic. Um, we go a little bit before that, but um, there had been a long trend uh, in my decade at the store of um, the company giving us less over the years. Uh, we saw them add 10 more hours onto requirement to get our health insurance after the ACA was passed. We saw that um, we went from having four opportunities at raises a year down to two, and the list goes on. Uh, but really, like with a lot of the new labor movement, it was, uh, it was definitely the pandemic that got people really wanting to organize. The first time that our manager had ever even made reference to COVID was to tell everybody in the store at a, hus at a huddle, um, that no one was allowed to wear masks or gloves in the store. He said that this would scare customers. So like off the bat, we realized uh, this is no longer just a thing that we want to do. This is something that we need to do just to to be sure that we have enough of say, a say in our workplace um, to keep ourselves safe and healthy. So um, that was definitely the starting point. Um, yeah, I guess uh, I can just go through this whole thing. There's a lot to the story. Uh, so I actually attempted to organize once before the successful campaign uh, at the beginning of 2021. We had a little organizing committee and I feel like um, that attempt, even though it only lasted a few months, taught us some valuable lessons in security. Um, we had another coworker who was sort of organizing parallel to what we were doing. They were more trying to set up um, lists of demands, uh, petitions, stuff like that, while we were organizing to get a union. And traditionally, generally, I don't really like the idea of um, doing certain kinds of organizing without the end goal of unionizing because um, it, tends to, it tends to elicit the same response uh, from the employer without sort of setting yourself up with the infrastructure to fight retaliation further down the road. But it just still puts that same target on your back. But um, what happened there was um, this person who had um, all the best intentions, you know what I mean, definitely had the heart for it was organizing, but they were having these conversations at the store, sometimes with an earshot of management. And, um, you know, not surprisingly, they were later on um, fired for unrelated reasons um, for swearing in the break room, which is something that no one's ever been fired for before. Yeah, um, they also got a write up uh, before that. Um, and this, this person is um, Latinx and East Asian. And it was interesting because um, our very white store captain at the time said um, they were racist for the fact that they had said it in, in the, like, as a part of a joke also, that they don't really trust uh, straight white men. So that's like, that's the kind of dynamic that existed at that store, yeah. Um, so that person had gotten fired and um, they actually had come in another time in the future and had a not so thinly veiled conversation with me about organizing an earshot of management that I feel like I would have sort of um, gathered what it was about if I was in management shoes. And within um, two hours, I was pulled in the back and given um, a quote unquote unrelated uh, write up uh, for attendance. So at that point, our organizing committee was like, it's probably time to lay low for a little bit, wait for things to like blow over, wait for some of the heat to die down, then get back to it. 
Um, unfortunately, a lot of people in that original organizing committee ended up leaving the company within months after that because unfortunately it was not the best place to work at the time. Uh, so a couple months go by, you know, we get to the, the new year and I was actually reached out to by Meg, who's currently our director of communications. And she was actually putting together a new organizing committee that was um, operating mainly in the morning crew. And this was a really big deal for us because the first time I was organizing, we were sort of like stuck in the night crew. And the one person who was in our organizing committee who was from the morning crew was actually on leave at the time. So um, this sort of allowed us to bring together those, those two different parts of the morning and night crew to actually um, start bringing that together and have a successful campaign. Uh, then from there, we just started, um, you know, mapping out the store, all the things that are pretty much, you know, textbook organizing. We map out the relationships, we gauge which people we want to talk to first, which people we maybe can tell will have like labor politics similar to ours. You know, obviously if there's um, a guy with like um, a MAGA sticker on his car, he might not be the first person you want to talk to. There's someone with a Bernie sticker uh, on their car who talks about how much they hate capitalism, they're probably a good person to talk to early on. But it's also a matter of the relationships too, because um, a lot of it does require having a certain rapport with people, having a certain level of trust, because um, if you're not able to sell them on this immediately, you still want to know that um, them knowing that you could get fired for this conversation getting back to management is something that you know they wouldn't want. You want to know that they'd make sure that you don't get in trouble for it. So that's a big part of it. and. Um, I think, um, I know this is the case with me, a lot of people will think that their workplace are not particularly clicky, that's what I thought, until you start organizing, then you realize like, hey, there's these people who I work with all the time who I don't really have any real relationship with. And that's um, one of the challenges you have in organizing, and I think it helps you to grow as an organizer, and even just makes you a better person to work with. You start to like have those conversations with people you maybe never talked to before, you find some common ground with them and you build that relationship, you get that rapport going. And then from there you can say like, hey, um, there's something I kind of want to talk with you about that's about work, but not something we can really talk about at work. And then you can exchange numbers and have that call. And um, even when we have those calls, like when I talk about security, it's very much um, an important thing that we, um, we take this step by step. We never rush anything. We don't want to scare people off, especially if like, um, scaring them off would mean they're more likely to compromise the security, right? So when we're having these conversations, if it's someone who's been there for a lot of years, we might just be able to talk about like, hey, you know, we've both been here for like 10 years. We know this is the trend in which the company's been going, right? This is the direction that things are going. We're getting less over the years. And they'll say like, all right, yeah, we're on the same page there. If it's someone who hasn't been there, then that's where you really have to make sure you know your shit and you're able to like educate these people and like so they have more of a historical context because for these people everything they're seeing like this is just the status quo as far as they know they don't know that you know over the past 10 years you know i mean people have been getting less in retirement contributions they've been having to work more to get their health insurance they've been getting less in the amount that they get in raises and less opportunities at raises those are all things that they wouldn't necessarily know so it's important to like um get them to that point and then um, once they're at that point where they acknowledge, like, we, we both agree that there's something that's wrong here, then you still don't necessarily bring up the U word. You might ask them, like, um, okay, so from here, would you say that, like, um, you agree that the people at the store should come together and try to fight these things? And if they agree there, that's where you can uh, bring up the word union. And even then, we don't just go into it and say, like, would you want to vote yes for a union? You know what I mean? Because even that could still be a little bit dangerous. You have to first approach it like, what do you know about unions? And that really gives you an opening to um, address any of the misinformation they've heard. Because like, this might not be as much of the case now, but definitely at the time we're organizing, most people don't know much about unions and labor outside of what they've been told by their bosses. So that gives us um, an opportunity to address things. Like um, one person says like, um, well, I know that unions um, don't really do much for you and you just have to give them all this money and dues. And then if you have like actually like done the homework, you can address those things like, all right, well, union dues in the US are roughly 2% on average, but people who are unionized are making 11% more on average. If you're black or a woman, that goes up to 13% more on average because unions are the best way to deal with uh, wage gaps. So like, as long as you've educated yourself and you navigate those conversations carefully and do like pretty good mapping, you can organize 
a large amount of people fairly safely. I shouldn't say large. Our store at the time had a little bit over 100 people. I think right now we have like 80 something. And um, the bigger your shop is, it's not necessarily like linear, like how difficult it becomes with a bigger shop. It's like exponential. So like uh, organizing a shop with 100 people versus 200 people, it's a whole different ball game because all it takes is a single slip up to uh, compromise your security. And depending on how badly it's compromised, that could mean the end of your campaign or it could force you to go public before you have a majority, which is extremely not ideal. Um, and in terms of security, that's also the reason why um, leading up to that point before we go public, any person who's talking to one of us doesn't know who else is on the organizing committee. So if, if I'm the person who's uh, your point person, you don't know that Meg or Woody or Tony are also organizers. You only know me. So worst case scenario, if you went to the store captain and said like, hey, they're organizing, they fire me, it's not gonna affect the rest of the organizing. It has a very like minimal impact, you know what I mean? And the only, um, exceptions to that would be if somebody actively said, hey, this is someone else you should talk to. I think that they'd be pro-union. So that would be like an exception to that kind of thing. But yeah, pretty much um, we would do that. And um, a funny thing that we would do after that, you know, we would tell them like, all right, so um, just get on signal. That's where we would do all of our communications. We would always have like um, notifications set to not show um, the name of chats or the name of who's in the chat or whatever else when somebody sends you a message. Um, Cause you know, your phone might be plugged in at the store. You might get a message. Somebody might see something pop up on your phone. Anything can happen, right? So like we tell people, all right, get on signal, shoot me a message when you get on signal and I'm gonna send you these two videos and then I'll follow up in a couple of days. And this is funny. One of the videos we sent is actually John Oliver video that he did on union busting which was like a very, very valuable resource. And it was good for preparing people from what would come after uh, we went public and everything. And the other video was actually on a Robert Reich video um, about like um, some common myths about unions. So that was, um, that was pretty much um, the formula at the early stage. And um, we just kept doing that. We went through um, all the people who we thought would be more supportive. Uh, we did it in that order. And then we um, ended up getting our majority, you know? Um, and at that point, uh, we started to like talk to more of the people who are more risky, but the people who are like, let's say they're known for like throwing their coworkers under the bus. You do have people like that. Those might be people that we don't even have that conversation with until the day before we go public. You know what I mean? Um, and that was the case. Um, so like once we go public, you know, that was a really big day. Oddly enough, it felt like a bigger deal than the actual day that we won the election. It was like really emotional. Um, uh, our organizing committee met up in the parking lot from the store. We had our little letter saying like we had a majority and that either they could, um, they could uh, accept this now where we can go to election. Um, they could voluntarily recognize if they wanted to do that. So we went in, we did that. Uh, and yeah, that was like, the first big moment in our organizing where we're like, wow, we've, um, we've crossed that first barrier because most, most of the time when people organize, that's not a point that they even get to, you know what I mean? And this is where this campaign becomes real in a lot of ways. This is where it becomes real in the sense that like, we can actually win this now, but it's also the point where, you know, we're gonna have targets on our back. And it's weird because like technically you're a little safer after you go public. At this point, the company knows who you are. There's a little bit more pressure. If they do something, you can actually like prove it's retaliation. Um, but at the same time, that, that microscope is on you now. Uh, and we would see that very soon after we went public. Um, something we didn't expect, you know what I mean? Even when we were like having those inoculation conversations with people and like planning them for what to expect once we go public and everything. Even at that point, something we didn't expect was that so much of the anti-union activity would come from crew members who would be deputized by the company and not directly from management. And don't get me wrong, the management definitely got their hands dirty more as well as time went on. Um, originally, the company was using um, Little or Mendelssohn. Uh, and then uh, after we won the election, they actually fired them along with transferring out the store captain. <laughs> um, and then they went with Morgan Lewis, who, of course, they're the ones who represent, represent um, Amazon. 
um, which is funny because a lot of our lawyers, also people who were working with Chris Smalls at Amazon labor union. So it is funny that we get into a bargaining table. There's just a lot of bad blood already, which works. You know, uh, I love that kind of energy. Um, I'm not really there to make friends with um, the company anyways. But uh, yeah, so at that stage in our organizing, we had gone public. We start seeing um, we start seeing upper management show up at the store. I'm getting texts like, "Hey, you, this guy said he was pro union, right? That's weird. I've seen him like outside with uh, the regional or the the regional VP, and they're just talking for a long time. Like, okay, that's odd. By the end of that day, um, this person and a couple other people who would end up making up like the anti union group in our store were planning to hold like anti union parties." Um, not the funnest party I could think of, but yeah, uh, they, they were already like planning that stuff by the end of that day, you know? So that was interesting and I'm sure entirely a coincidence. Um, so we had some of that stuff going on. Very quickly, we had um, a lot of these weird stories coming up. Um, a lot of those same people who um, I know that our organizers had spoken to, they're telling me like, yeah, you know, I just felt upset because no one talked to me about this. And I would actually go to other organizers and be like, hey, why don't you, I thought you talked to this person. They're like, oh, we did, it's on the spreadsheet. I'm like, okay, it is, that's odd. Um, but yeah, so like the company pretty much deputized that group of people. They were above the law, they were given free reign. So at our store, we'll have a log that says like what everyone's doing for each hour of their shift. Um, for these people, regardless of what was on their log, they could do what they want. So if they were supposed to be on register, Instead, they might be outside of the store having a meeting trying to convince people to vote no on the union. Um, and another thing that also goes along with that, since um, the company can always say they didn't tell them to say these things, they can get away with a lot of things that would be an unfair labor practice if the company were to do it. So if the company were to say, all right, um, if you guys organize or sharing the store now, that's an, it's an easy ULP, you know what I mean? Um, so instead, these people were saying that, you know what I mean? Also, they would like um, fabricate stories about the individual organizers. The story was that um, Meg and myself were approached by some shadowy union individual and paid secretly to organize the store. Um, if I was paid to organize at the point, it wouldn't have been a secret because um, we were all working full-time jobs for free. Uh, but unfortunately, that wasn't the case. Uh, so there was that, there was like more serious stuff. Um, one of our organizers, Woody, had pretty famously lost his health insurance when he had cancer. And they were going around saying that was a story that was made up, despite the fact that management knew about this. The, a lot of the coworkers were there while this was going on, while he was still fighting to keep his health insurance. Um, so that was sort of like how dirty they were playing, you know? And it's also interesting, cause like we were talking a lot today about, um, about young people and organizing. And it was funny because the first thing that happened was the anti-unioners sort of just assumed these young people were very dumb and naive and that they'd be easily manipulated. So first they spent a lot of their energy and time trying to get those people on board with them and convince them that organizing would not actually benefit them in any way. Then when they realized that that wasn't working, they started telling all the older crew members that they don't think that the younger people should be allowed to vote. Uh, because a lot of them are students and wouldn't be with the company for a long time. One of the anti-unioners even wrote um, a letter that they gave out before the election that was saying like, you're young, you know what I mean? You're young and I know you don't really know a lot yet. It was just like extremely condescending and they were doing this with like a lot of the younger employees. Um, their strategy there was a little all over the place, but it, it tends to be. Um, I don't think the company or the anti-unioners have been the best in terms of strategy. And when you're fighting on the wrong side of things, you probably have to be a little bit better in terms of strategy to kind of make up for that. And they definitely weren't. Um, so time goes on, we have all this anti-union activity going on. Things were getting very tense in the store. Um, it was weird because people would always talk about, particularly anti-unioners and management, would talk about how, um, what we were doing made things divisive. But in practice, we were trying to bring people together. And on the other hand, the people who are anti-unioners were allowed to scream at us during our shifts on the sales floor when people are coming into shop. They were screaming at people, cursing on the sales floor, all of that. 
That was a regular occurrence and management was there for a lot of it, did nothing to intervene. And they knew about all of it, did nothing to intervene. And um, yeah, we were the ones that were making things divisive. You know what I mean? So like that was what the atmosphere was like in the store. Um, thankfully, I didn't have to deal with much of that directly because I was in the night crew um, and most of the activity was happening in the earlier shifts. Uh, with our organizing committee, um, there's like six of us before we went public and out of that group, like five of them were doing the mornings and I was the sole person who was doing the night, um, which was a lot, but also it was a little bit easier because um, I had attempted to organize the year before, so we already had a foundation of support in the nights. So that was a plus. Um, and because we already had that foundation, there wasn't really a lot of room for the anti-union movement to grow on that end. And that was definitely uh, nice for me because I didn't have to deal with it. Um, and it was nice for all the union supporters. And that sort of gave us this, um, this entire half of the workday where everyone there was pretty much pro-union and nobody had to worry about dealing with any of that stuff. Um, but for those of us who worked in the morning, it was generally a nightmare, you know. Um, that was like, uh, there's been a couple of times where I'd picked up earlier shifts and uh, it was, uh, I, I was perfectly comfortable. I made sure that they knew I was comfortable, which made um, the anti unionists I think, feel a little more awkward. So that was a plus. Whatever I can do to make them uncomfortable is always a plus for me. Um, but yeah, so um, we were at that point, you know, uh, we're starting to try to get people to show more open support. You know, obviously in organizing, we always talk about structure testing. You want to make sure that um, your base of support is really um, as supportive as you think they are. You want to do small actions that escalate so you can gauge where your weak points are. You can like follow up with those people. Uh, you can see maybe like what's holding them back from engaging in actions. And um, as time goes on, people become more comfortable. They become more confident because they see how much support you have. And that's what allows them to get to the point where they start um, being willing, they start to become willing to take uh, actions that have higher stakes. So um, even though it's not something that people would traditionally think of as um, structure testing, even something as simple as having like a union party where all the supporters are forced to finally be open about their support. Because up until that point, we were drilling into everyone's head, this like, I don't care what is going on, we never talk about this in the store, this doesn't exist in the store, you know what I mean? And now it's like, all right, at this point, people need to know that there's other supporters so they can, so they can have the confidence to know that they can win. You know what I mean? Because without that confidence, people get scared, people start to fold, all of that, which we don't want, right? So um, we start having our little um, union party, stuff like that. I came in with my union pin, um, was sent home for wearing it. Um, yeah. Uh, and um, that was actually a funny story because um, that day, uh, there's actually a New York Times photographer out there uh, taking photos with Tony, who was one of our organizers and our former director of organizing too, once we had a national structure. Um, so one of our managers kicked him out uh, and the photographer and then immediately after asked me to take my pin off and I'm like, pretty sure this is legally protected. She's like, mm, I don't know. I pulled up the NLRB website and I was like, all right, this is the law. She's like, okay, but it's not in our handbook, which was interesting. Um, the assumption that the handbook trumps federal labor law, um, but that's a recurring theme there. Uh, but it sort of worked in our favor because we were doing all of the work anyways to build that support and to get all these people more comfortable with being open supporters. So all that ended up happening was the company wasn't accurately able to gauge where we were. So up until the day that we had our red shirt day where all the union supporters were the same color, up until that day, they thought that they were winning the election. And I could tell by the way that they were acting. And uh, the day we all came in in red, it was suddenly a very different vibe. Uh, management was panicked. Um, they were, they actually like went on a spree of unfair labor practices that day. They, uh, they were, actively asking people if they were union supporters. Um, this one new kid just got interrogated by a manager and he didn't, he just wore red just by coincidence. He didn't even know it was a red shirt day. He was a new hire. Um, and he literally told us after, he's like, you know, I, was, I wasn't really going to even vote and now I'm going to vote yes because of that experience. So like, all right. Um, so it's it also really helped that the company kept showing their true colors, you know? So we had the red shirt day and um, 
I think the next week we ended up having our big rally outside of the store, which had like huge support. It was really big. We had a lot of support from like different unions. Uh, we had gotten a lot of help from um, the Pioneer Valley's Worker Center. Um, so it was like really cool, a lot of support out there. And um, at that point, the company, I feel like finally realized that they were in trouble. And uh, the following days, they started having like these like, um, well, they were already having like one-on-one -on -one cab of audience meetings, but that's when they started actually like bringing people together as a group and trying to actively like directly ask them not to vote yes for the union, um, which as you know now, did not work. Um, a week after that, we had our election and we ended up making history in the 53 years of Trader Joe's. Um, we were the first uh, successful union campaign. And um, in that time, and I do feel like this is particularly impressive as like a group of people that are entirely worker led, um, entirely independent, we were able to do it. No one else had successfully done 53 years, uh, four times, you know what I mean? in Hadley, then in Minneapolis, in Louisville, Kentucky, and um, in Oakland. And uh, the day of the Oakland election, we actually had two elections. We had one that was uh, in Oakland, California, and one that was in New York City. Um, the New York City election, we actually lost by a tie, um, which was somehow a lot more difficult to deal with than just losing. But um, that one right now we're challenging um, under the new CMEX order because there were laws that were broken. And um, the way that's supposed to work is as soon as there's um, unfair labor practice that's committed, we should be able to like go straight to a bargaining order so long as we already had a majority before that. And we had a super majority of cards in that location. So hopefully that'll work out well and um, that would make it five locals. Um, and um, though I won't go into specifics, there's certainly gonna be more uh, on the way. Yeah, so that's sort of like where we are now. There's a lot more that's happened too, in terms of retaliation. Um, two things I'll touch on will be some stuff that's happened with me and something that's happened with um, one of our artists, Steve. Um, a little bit after that last batch of elections, one of our store artists was fired. Um, Steve Andrade is a credible artist and he's been an um, artist at this store for a very long time. He's been working with the company, I think um, twice as long as I have. Um, and he was fired supposedly because he left a jigsaw in the store um, that the company asked him to take home. The issue there obviously was for anyone who knows the story, the jigsaw wasn't his to begin with. It had actually been in the store before he was working there. It was purchased by another store artist, his wife, um, on the ask of management. Um, and there's like a long weird history at that store of management asking the artist to buy and use power tools that they have no training with. Um, Meg used to be a store artist and there were tools that she wasn't comfortable using and they used to just tell her, that's the job, just do it. You know what I mean? So that's sort of the culture there. Um, of course, Steve was um, an outspoken union supporter and he was outspoken about issues he had with the direction the company was going, particularly in the way that they're dealing with their store artists. Um, so that was um, a moment where like, it was actually a point in time where we had a lot of new people and i'm just like you know we have um a challenge ahead of us to organize this huge batch of um new employees and as often as the case the company just um did something so outrageous that it sort of did the organizing for us uh, they're very good at um uh, coming up with plans that only backfire on them um so we ended up actually um presenting a petition first and then we did our first walkout that we've done um at hadley there was one also that happened in um, minneapolis we did a walkout that actually ended up being i think the largest action that we've ever done in terms of the support that came out uh we marched around the store we had like we had a bunch of customers we had people from all these different unions different community leaders it was um it was really powerful in seeing like all these people come out for steve and um, yeah, as is often the case, after we did that, there was a long, a long uh, period of quiet. There tends to be um, a period after major actions occur where the company seems to like back off a little bit. And then usually when you have a wave of people leaving the store and new hires coming in, and there hasn't been action for a while, that's when they'll start to um, try to union bust again. That's when they think that they have the upper hand. Um, so a more recent thing that's actually happened, um, we had one crew member who was facing some legal issues and the company secretly asked her if she would like to take $20,000 to quit the job. Um, yeah, she ended up calling me immediately after that conversation happened. 
and I hope the story isn't going on too long, just there's so many layers to it, but um, she ended up calling me when that happened and I was just like, all right, first we're gonna call Seth, who's one of our lawyers. We immediately get on a freeway call with Seth. We immediately got the charges done. Um, the company didn't even know I knew about that at that point. Um, and then she just continued to work. But the next time she came in, they asked like, how do you feel about that offer? Are you gonna do this? And she said, I actually enjoy working here. I don't want to. And then they said, all right, then we're going to have to place you on um, uh, administrative leave, which is not a thing at Trader Joe's. Um, and when they first talked to her, the day where they offered her the $20,000, they specifically said she hadn't done anything wrong and they were just trying to make her life less stressful. Now suddenly, um, they were saying that um, people she was working with weren't comfortable working with her. And um, one thing I will say that um, everyone was telling me before that was that one of the outspoken anti-union people was actually leading a campaign where he was soliciting people to reach out to HR to get her fired as soon as she um, had come back from her leave. Um, so there's a lot of shady activity going on. Um, and the day she got put on leave, I happened to also have a shift. So naturally I'm like, I would like to talk with our store captain, Matt. Um, so I'm looking around for him at the store. I eventually find him and I was like, hey, Matt, um, would you be available to talk right now? Uh, he looks around and, you know, fair enough. The store is really busy. He's like, not right now. Um, and I'm just like, all right, when would you be available to talk? And he's, uh, I think he's sort of trying to gauge how much I know about what had just happened. He's like, all right, what is this about? I'm like, it's about the fact that you sent this person on a leave, you engaged in direct dealing, uh, you have to stop breaking the law, you know? Um, he says, um, well, that's something you're gonna have to call the office about, meaning headquarters. And I'm just like, but you're the one who had a conversation with her. He's like, that's something you're gonna have to call the office about. And I'm just like, is this the one thing we can't talk about? Um, because traditionally we would have conversations about things up until that point, despite the fact that he's um, been involved in a lot of the shady stuff that went on, we had an otherwise like pretty respectful, chill relationship where we could talk about things and try to work out and iron out things that were going on related to other managers when they were um, acting in a way that I felt wasn't appropriate towards um, union supporters. Um, but this time the conversation ended, I'm like, all right, cool. So I ended up going on register, actually having a lot of fun that day on register, having the time of my life with customers, and then doing another hour when I'm working at the beverage section. Two hours pass, everybody's chilling. Um, suddenly Matt comes up to me and he's just like, hey, actually, do you have a second to talk? I'm like, yeah. I'm expecting him to give me like a BS story about what was actually going on. But instead he says, um, also, if you want to grab a wine garden rep, this would be a good time. So like, okay, interesting. Tony just happened to be um, starting a shift. So I'm just like, Tony, would you want to just um, walk with us real quick? Uh, I'm going to need a wine garden rep. He's like, oh, interesting. Okay. And the store captain tells me, uh, I'm going to have to ask you to get your belongings and leave the store. Um, your behavior was aggressive and very threatening, uh, which is, there's a lot you could read into that, especially uh, as he's a dude who has like the thin blue line patch and like the Punisher patch on his backpack. Um, though that's disappeared since I've made a big fuss about it. But um, I was kicked out of the store. Um, and what they usually will try to do is um, give someone the impression that they're fired so they don't come in and then they might just get them for job abandonment. Thankfully, Tony asked like, wait, did you check to see if you're still coming in tomorrow? So I asked and he's like, as of right now, yes, you can still come in tomorrow. So um, what's normally the case in this situation is if somebody gets kicked out of the store, it means they're being fired the next day. So I preemptively made a big post on Facebook, or not Facebook, I don't use Facebook, but on Instagram, still meta. And um, I did it as a collaborative post with um, our official union account. And it got a lot of um, eyes on the situation. Um, there was people coming in the next day asking me about what had happened, who just saw what happened from online. So this definitely, I think, got back from the company, got back to the company. And I think that's probably what saved me from getting fired at that point. But still, the next day when I came in, you know, um, right before I go on register, they're like, hey, Jamie, would you mind talking with us real quick? I'm like, all righty. I grabbed Tony again. I'm like, this is it. Expect to get fired. Instead, they hand me a write-up. So while the manager's actually reading what's on the write-up, I'm sort of peeking over his shoulder to skip ahead a little bit. And I actually stopped him just like, this never happened. It's saying, um, prepare. It's saying that um, I, physically lunged at him with my fist directed towards his head. 
and yelled, don't do that. <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not even sure what that's referencing. Uh, maybe be saying, stop breaking the law. But um, this was wild because um, one of um, my coworkers who also has other issues that were going on with the company because um, they were blocking him from being able to transfer because we're in a union store. And um, that's, a, that's a whole other story for another day. But um, he happened to be standing next to me when the actual conversation happened. And he laughed hysterically when I told him what the write-up said, um, which was both like, in the typical Trader Joe's fashion, it was both infuriating and also hilarious because it was so outrageous. Um, I wasn't super concerned. Um, I had a witness to what had actually happened. There wouldn't be any witnesses to me saying that because it didn't actually happen. And um, I knew that once we filed charges, this would eventually end up in a hearing. And at some point that store captain is going to have to decide whether he's going to um, say what actually happened or if he's gonna commit perjury um, in a hearing. So that'll, that'll be his call to make, which I'm not particularly worried about one way or another. But um, that's some of what was happening recently. And, um, after that, the store manager was actually gone for a while. Um, he, my guess was they were going to probably transfer him out if it didn't blow over. Um, they said he was on vacation, but they had other store captains covering for him while he was gone, which is in my decade at store, not a thing that's ever happened when someone's on vacation. Um, eventually he did end up coming back. Um, and the most recent thing that's happened since then, because we don't really interact after that. We haven't interacted after that much, um, except from awkwardly saying hi to me, which is like, he knows what he did. It's just weird that he's still trying to like interact, but like, you know, that's, that's what he wants to do. But um, the last thing that happened, which is actually um, just this past week, we found a bunch of anti-union cards with QR codes that were being handed out at the demo station. And, um, I called my lawyer immediately and I'm just like, all right, we're going to have to talk with him about this, but I don't really want a repeat of last time. And he's like, yeah, this time bring more than one witness, bring like, bring like five witnesses or something I'm like, or, um, we grabbed five witnesses, um, and we approached store captain and was sort of just like, all right, um, these are some cards that were left on demo and on some of the registers that were like, you know, being handed out to customers. Um, my question is, a, did you know about this? If you did know about this, are we allowed to do the same? You know what I mean? Because obviously, otherwise that would be solicitation discrimination. And the other question was, um, uh, if you didn't know about this, are you planning on investigating? First, he denied that. He, he didn't really even acknowledge that he believed that the card was there. He's like, how do I know that card was even there? I'm like, well, people saw it. I have a photo of it. You know what I mean? Um, and then after that, he said he had no knowledge of it, but it was funny because he's like, why did you find it necessary to bring all these people up with you to do this? And I'm just like, uh, we know what happened last time we had a conversation. Um, so I really don't want you to lie again, uh, which he didn't particularly like. And he's just like, this conversation's over. Um, and I sort of, before I left, I was just like, well, we have witnesses now, so you can't say I lunged at you this time, um, which he also did not like. Um, and it was, it was definitely an interesting moment. Um, not to be too petty here, but he was shaking. You know what I mean? And I do think it's funny because um, he hasn't been at the store any of the days that we've done any of our big actions. And he's very comfortable screaming at people, berating them at work, but he's not used to that table being turned where he's not the one who has the power, you know, in a situation. So when the workers actually confronted him, you could see he was visibly flustered and didn't really know what to do. Um, but that's sort of um, the stage we're at right now, you know what I mean? Um, things have been going very good on the legal side of things. I'm very confident that um, Steve is going to get his job back. Um, I'm very confident that regardless of how long it may take, that um, the Louisville store will be certified because they've been challenging that election since they won very decisively. Um, and I'm fairly confident, hopefully, that we'll end up getting a bargaining order from the New York City store. So um, that's um, pretty much where things stand right now. And um, yeah, hopefully we'll keep moving in a positive direction. Uh, just a couple weeks ago, we had our first bargaining session for the Oakland store and um, feeling pretty optimistic about where things are gonna go. I'm not expecting the union busting to stop, but I'm also not particularly concerned with it, um, at least how it relates to me. I know that um, we're gonna do charges every time these things happen. And as has been the case, the company will have to answer for these things. And um, ultimately we know we'll be vindicated at the end of it. So, um, yeah.
an epic story. Thank you. Um, I'm just curious, in all of this work you've done, mm -hmm. like, what are some of the biggest things you've learned uh, that you'd like to maybe impart on people who are thinking about organizing? So, let me see. I would say one of the biggest things I always say is security. Um, a lot of times I'll do an event and um, somebody will raise their hand, they'll say, hey, I'm so-and-so, I work at such and such place, how do I organize? And I'll usually say, not like that. Um, security is everything. When I started um, organizing, I made burner accounts, you know what I mean? Like, I wouldn't follow anything labor-related on my Instagram account. When I was like watching videos to teach me like uh, some of the basics of organizing, I would do that on a separate YouTube account. You know what I mean? There, was, there wasn't gonna be a way that somebody can see a post that I liked that would indicate to them that I was even interested in organizing. You know what I mean? And that's something that um, I occasionally have to remind people too when they follow um, our Instagram accounts, our social media, that you have to be careful with these things. If you're someone who's trying to organize, maybe follow that from like, um, you know, your backup account or something. Um, you don't want people to really know where you stand until that organizing is happening and until you have um, your majority and you go public. So I would definitely say security is the biggest thing. Um, I would also say like, if this goes with security, not rushing. Um, rushing causes people to make entirely preventable errors that sink entire campaigns all the time. Everywhere, right now, as we're speaking, there's someone whose campaign is being sunk because they're rushing and they're focused on getting to a certain point by a certain timeline instead of focusing on getting certain benchmarks of organizing before progressing. So that's another really huge thing. And a really big thing that unfortunately no one believes till they're in that situation, not everyone is acting in good faith. There are people who experience privilege at your job. There are people who benefit from favoritism. Those people may not have an interest in seeing something that works for everybody else, but would also not necessarily benefit them. And you have to understand that when you're organizing, some of these people are speaking with you for the soul, with the sole intention of taking up your time when you're trying to organize, you know what I mean? And um, I'll, be, I'll navigate this part kind of cautiously, but a lot of this will consistently fall along the lines of someone's political ideology. If people have um, politics that tend to be very individualistic, very, um, you know, pro-free market, um, these people are oftentimes going to be the people who are going to be opposed to it. And you can definitely still talk to those people and you can move those people. When you do move those people though, you'll often find that it comes with like changing some of those beliefs. They have to actually realize that like, um, we can't just count on companies and corporations to, to do this for us. This is something that we need to do ourselves and we need to work together on. And that, but that like on a fundamental level does not work with the hyper individualistic perspective where like it's every man for themselves, where workers should be competing with each other for the boss's favor, favor like, um, it's really important that people like sort of um, get rid of that sort of perspective to be able to get to that point. And when they don't, it doesn't work, you know what I mean? And um, I hate to say, but um, actually maybe this is a good thing to say, because um, I wouldn't necessarily want people with certain views to be supporters, but if you look at a Venn diagram of every transphobe, homophobe, everyone who says racial statements that are a little strange, and you look at a list of people who will be opposed to the union, and I'm not saying that everyone who's anti-union at our store falls into that category, but all the people who fall into that category are anti-union, you know what I mean? You'll find out that, that Venn diagram is one circle. So um, that's, uh, that might be a spicy take, but the more campaigns I see, the more obvious that becomes, because um, ultimately you can move people on this subject, but they would have to sort of they'd have to unlearn some of those um, values that led them into that place to begin with to even get there. So that's, um, that's something that people should be aware of, you know. Realistically, there are issues that we need to organize to, to deal with, and I want to be um, pushing us in the right direction there, you know what I mean? Um, so that's a big part of it for me, and um, really um, the circumstances like all the conditions that led us in this direction, whether that's the pandemic, or whether that's the loss of different benefits, um, those are just the things that made it very clear that we needed to do it and that it was possible to do. Um, but a lot of people, the entirety of the time I've been working there, 
wanted to see that as a unionized store. You know what I mean? But it wasn't it wasn't the time yet. And um, you know, everything uh, sort of uh, put us in that place and time where we could organize. So we acted on it. That's incredible. Um, is there anything else you want to say about, um, I guess, sort of looking ahead? Um, yeah, I would say um, to our workers, organize. You know what I mean? Like, um, there's not any place that shouldn't be organized. If you, if you look back, um, you'll see that wages were raising at the, wages were going up at the same rate of um, productivity throughout the entire time period that we had high union density. As union density drops, you'll start to see that wages stagnate while the productivity keeps rising. So like, we want to make sure that um, we're doing our part because um, it doesn't just affect your shop. Um, this affects even workplaces that aren't unionized as they're going to then have to compete with unionized shops um, in order to maintain like their workforce. So I would definitely say people should uh, try to organize their their works their workplaces and um, you know and educate yourself on this stuff so when that time comes to organize you're able to give people the answers to their questions and be an effective organizer yeah that is a perfect way to wrap it up I think perfect. and then uh, maybe on a personal note uh, mm -hmm. do, are there any like Trader Joe's products that you see people love mm -hmm. but you are just like, people don't know the half of it, don't know what goes yeah. into it. <laughs> well, all right, so I would say, I gotta be careful here. I'm not sure, um, I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, me. okay, okay. There's rocks in everything, I'll say that. Okay. Um, this is a bit of a running joke at the store. There's that, uh, there's just like back-to-back -back recalls because there's rocks in things. Um, and it's such a weird thing. Uh, but like, you know, those extra crunchy cookies, there's a reason they're extra crunchy because there's rocks <laughs> in it. But uh, yeah, there was just back-to-back -back recalls about rocks and things that were just very odd. And it became a running joke at the store. Um, <laughs> but in general, I think um, a lot of the products are good. Um, I'm a vegan, so I'm always like mad because they're discontinuing things I like, but um, I'm a big fan of the beefless bulgogi. Mm -hmm. Though I don't want to give an advertisement for the company right now. We're not on good terms. No, no, no. Yeah, so. Um, just 